Alrighty, good morning or afternoon, wherever this finds you. I'm Mr. Mayus, and we're going to take a look at Ancient China Part 2, from the Zhao Dynasty to the Han Dynasty. Where we left off after Part 1 was that the, the Zhao Empire um, was broken up into a number of different states, kind of like Victoria, New South Wales, Western Australia, all of that, um, but in a slightly more independent way. After about four or five hundred years, um, you have um, these different states uh, being quite independent, some of them more independent than others, um, particularly one, the, the Qin. Now, they were on the west, so uh, the majority of their enemies were on one side. Perhaps it made it a little bit easier. They also had uh, the Yellow River running through there, which made it um, you know, very fertile land and, and um, it was a very powerful place. As time went on, they sort of took over everyone else, and they eventually reunited China and, and formed the, the, the Qin Dynasty. Um, they existed as a Qin Dynasty for only about 20 years. Basically, there's one guy, which we'll talk about in just a moment, and his son for a very short time, um, and then the, uh, the, the Han took over. Um, but the Qin left a mark on China like no one else ever, ever has. And we'll take a look at that. So Ying Zhen was the leader of the Qin state since he was young. I think he was about 13. And um, as an adult, he defeated the, the last Zhao state and, and united China in, in 221 BC. Here's a, a picture courtesy of uh, Oxford Big Ideas. Um, he looks kind of fierce there with his bulbous nose and his eyes and... He's very uh, well-dressed, I guess, for those times. Um, when he took over, um, he named himself emperor, not just a leader like the other um, Shang and uh, Zhao uh, dynasties had, but he named himself emperor, and he changed his name to Shi Huangdi. I apologize, my accent is probably horrible. However, it's close enough. Shi Huangdi. Now, if you break it down, Shi means first, and Huangdi means emperor. There's an interesting thing there. Huang apparently has this idea of being shining, or radiant, or brilliant, that was mostly to describe heaven. So there's this idea of being godlike in his title, and this is actually a form of propaganda. Whenever they would say his name, they're essentially saying, the first godly emperor. And that's one of the small ways that I think he helped to uh, uh, keep power. When he took over, he did some awesome things that made China really what it is. Um, the first thing he did was, well, not the first thing, but one of the things he did was he actually made sure that all carts had the same axle. The axle is the width of the tires. He made sure that all the carts were the same length. Why? Well, there's a lot of different states and a different people, and he wanted to unite them and make travel easier. If everyone had the same uh, width cars, you know, they didn't have paved roads back then, they just had dirt tracks. Um, if you had a smaller smaller cart, you'd have one wheel on the track and the other wheel would be heading straight down the middle. It was very difficult to get places. These axles made uh, trade um, easier and helped people get around. He also um, standardized the writing symbols. In English, we have the alphabet. A, B, C, these are sounds. As briefly mentioned in, in the past, uh, in part one, Chinese writing is actually pictographs. Now, I can't read much of any of it at all, but somehow these things represent pictures. You know, maybe this is land, and uh, I don't know, that could be, I don't know what it is. I'm not even going to hazard a guess. But they're somehow related to very simple pictures. And when he made all of these writing symbols the same, anyone, no matter even if they had a different accent, or a, a different slight dialect, they could write it down and they could understand what the other person was saying. Another thing that he did is he made sure that all the weights and the lengths of measurements uh, were equal. That way, if you're trading, oh, say, one, one uh, part of, of, of flour or wheat here, it is the same amount in a distant land or in a distant state. Um, these three things helped just to make them all one people with one, uh, one system of, of getting around. He also did away with all of those um, other states. He made one central government where he was in, was in charge. And what he said was law. He had one law for his empire, and that was his. Now, he was really pretty harsh with this law. 
We'll talk about it in a little bit, but basically, if you stepped out of line at all, you would could face death, could face uh, becoming a prisoner, um, or have to do hard labor um, building things, like building roads, um, or adjusting things, which we'll talk about in, this, in, in a moment here. He was very harsh, and he didn't put up with anything. Um, if you remember from the last one, the belief system that we talked about, um, there's a sense of independent responsibility. This man, um, Shi Wang Di, did not tolerate anyone saying, you're our king, you're our emperor, you should treat us like this. He said, no, it's my way, or <laughs> bad things will happen to you. A couple of the things that he did, which was awesome. One, he built roads, and this made trade and travel and army movements a lot easier all around China. Um, another thing he did is he actually connected different, or he made the Great Wall great. Now there were many, um, there are many little, uh, little walls up along the northern part of, uh, of China, and they were to stop people invading. However, he connected them and expanded them and, and made the Great Wall of China. Now, the way they, they built walls, like then is they have sort of these brick outsides, and they just fill up and pack it down with dirt on the inside. It's incredibly stable. It's, it still exists today. And some of the brickwork is gone, but this central area, they just pack it down. It's, it's like concrete. Now, the people that were working on it were army, and they were also a lot of slaves. And some of these areas, if you want to take a look at, at, at this picture, as you can see, these are on the top of mountains, some very horrible places to work, um, very isolated. Um, but basically, if you happen to die while you were out there, you just kind of get thrown out into the mix. There's an estimated, I think, 100,000 people that are buried within the wall. Longest graveyard in the world. Um, with the wall, you can actually see here, um, he included little what are these um, uh, points along the wall every half mile or so, or sorry, every K or so, um, and they had little fires on the top of each one. So if, if this t uh, person, or that, the people guarding that station over there, saw some invaders coming up, they'd light their fire, and within a, a few minutes or an hour, it would get all the way down the wall, thousands of, of, of kilometers, and they would know that's, that, that people are uh, in invading. Um, they, I'm not sure how long it took, but uh, it was a tremendous task, and it is really one of the the, the marvels of, of the world. I talked about before how he was um, kind of harsh. Um, we talked about Confucius back. There's a picture of Confucius. Um, and he basically hated Confucius's teaching. He hated it because it gave people permission to criticize him. Remember, he said whatever was his law, whatever was whatever he said was law. So if people were criticizing him, they would often be killed just for even reading Confucius. Not that they had even criticized him, just reading him. So he also burned a lot of uh, Confucius's writings. In the last years of, of Shi Huangdi's life, he became obsessed with keeping power and avoiding death. And he was paranoid of assassinations. I mean, he wanted to live forever, and he sent um, m many people after the elixir of life. Now, this is just an image of uh, something that I pulled off um, off Google. I, I just thought it was pretty. This very, you know, beautiful. It looks almost sacred um, liquid there. But he thought that um, if there is a potion that you could take to live forever, and he sent people to to try to find it. He's also paranoid of people trying to kill him. I think when he was, uh, he was like 15 or 16, and he was leading the Qin state, he, uh, someone tried to kill him. Uh, I can't remember um, what else happened. A number of people uh, tried to kill him. One guy was trying to give him a gift uh, of, of some one of his enemy's heads, and then tried to stab him. But because uh, Shi Wangdi, now that's, that's Confucius, because Shi Wangdi had a sword, he's able to fight him off. But it actually became a crime to know where he was at any given time. He would actually have a few carts to bring him along. Um, and he would be in any one of them, he, and no one really knew. There was one assassination plot where a big strong guy threw a little guy onto his cart, and the little guy had a knife. 
um, or some weapon. And look, unfortunately for the little guy, it was the wrong cart. Um, anyway, moving on. He was, he was very paranoid and did whatever he could to stay alive. He was also um, kind of crazy. He built uh, it, many, many things um, in glory to himself. There's this mountain. You can see how big it is. I think that's a little car right there. It's a mausoleum, which is basically a gravestone. And you can read this picture here. Here, you might want to pause it to read the whole thing. But basically, it's a it's an underground pyramid that has a whole map of China um, with uh, with Mercury rivers and a Mercury ocean. Um, and he had uh, these terracotta warriors, all about six thousand individually unique soldiers um, guarding the entrance. Um, and he actually had um, a full armory full of full of weapons. If you want to take a look here, this is an artist's rendition of what, you know, actually no one really knows what it looks like inside. They're starting to map it out, but even now, they haven't actually gotten down in there to see. It's encased in copper or bronze, um, but supposedly he was buried down in there in, in an amount, sorry, in and around his awesome map of China. Um... No one really knows it's down there, and maybe we'll find out uh, sometime soon, hopefully. All right, so he was crazy and obsessed with staying alive, and he did everything to, to do his best um, or to you know keep power. Um, on a side note, very quickly, um, his son said, It's not right that um, the, my father's wives, who had no sons, should be separate from him. So when he died, uh, they were buried in this mountain with him. Okay, so Shi Wang Di, uh, one day he died. We don't really know why he died exactly. It's possible because he took some potion to try to uh, stay alive. But they used to uh, carry him around in his carts, as I mentioned before. And they were carrying him around, and he died, but they were away from everyone else. And they tried to... Um, he, sorry, Shi Wang Di didn't leave clear who he wanted to succeed him when he died. So they actually uh, stalled letting the world know that he had died. They actually carried him around dead for about two months. And they actually put stinky fish before him and after him so no one would smell him. So he was walking, he was walked around the city while his, um, his viziers um, tried to arrange for a proper son to take over. Um, a son did take over, um, but he only lasted uh, a very short time. Um, Shi Wang Di was um, one of the two emperors, and he was a powerful leader, and he, he, he shaped China in, in more long-lasting long -lasting ways than anyone else. He was brilliant, but he's also harsh, and he was a megalomaniac. He was just obsessed with himself. So what happened after Shi Wang Di died? Well, civil war for about eight years. Um, I'm not sure if they killed his son, who took power, but eventually um, some guy named uh, Liu Bei uh, and the Han army took control. And this was the start of the Han Dynasty, and it was uh, the golden age of ancient China. Um, he, we'll talk about it a little bit in the future, but uh, Liu Bei um, made things easier. People were allowed to read Confucius anymore, and he expanded um, trade, which is one of the reasons why the Han Dynasty spread um, so much. So that's basically how we got from uh, the Zhou to the Han. Um, it was largely because of uh, Shi Wangdi, um, who was crazy, but um, did some amazing things to just bring everyone together by force. Um, that's where we'll leave it this time. There's a few questions for you to answer, but I uh, hope you enjoyed it. Uh, episode 2, done.